<laughs> I've really just noticed it. <laughs> oh, that is so cool. Right. Okay. I'm such a muppet for not spotting that. <laughs> a muppet. <laughs> no, I don't know. Right. Al. Oh. <laughs> okay. Hello there. My name is Kit Rackley. My pronouns are they, them, and this is Coffee and Geography. The aim of the show is to get to know, explore, and celebrate the diverse and intersectional range of people on this rock we call home and their love and passions of it. We'll find out why guests identify as geographers, and if they don't exactly, we'll have fun exploring all the myriad of ways that connects their life to geography. So, pour your favourite brew, get cosy and listen in. Oh, and don't forget to subscribe and follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPot. Off we go. Hi everybody, welcome back to Coffee and Geography and it's the end of Pride Month now, coming towards the end of Pride Month um, because I'm recording this at the end of June and what a perfect time to be talking to this fabulous person. So Al Snow, hello, happy Pride Month to you. Happy Pride Month to you as well. Yeah, and you know what? This recording probably won't be going out until like September or something, but who cares? Because for us, it's Pride Month every month. So happy Pride Month, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Al has graduated with applied physics at University of California, Irvine. Woohoo, congratulations. And they uh, mostly focus their research on studying superfluids. And you're soon to attend the University of Washington in the fall, or autumn as we say over here, as a graduate student studying physics. So Congratulations, that is absolutely great news. Um, they are a huge theme park nerd and transportation enthusiast. We're definitely going to talk about that a bit later. Uh, Al is an amateur musician and really loves to perform, and they hope someday to find a career balancing research and education as they are passionate about STEM education, specifically around making it more equitable and accessible. And Al, you are pl- proudly lesbian and non-binary, so kindred spirits, both non-binary people here sitting proudly in Pride Month. How are you doing today then? I am doing all right. I am currently in Irvine and it is pretty warm today, but Mm. it was warmer over the weekend. So, you know, we just finished the heat wave and it's cooling down. So that's nice. Yeah. A flashback for everybody, because of course, if you're listening to this in September, October time, when things are starting to cool down in general, we are recording this, of course, on the very day that there is that excessive heat just to the north of you, you know, in the state of Oregon and Washington and into uh, into British Columbia as well in, in Canada. And I just could not believe the h- like highs of 47 degrees Celsius, you know, in, you know, 110 degrees Fahrenheit. It's absolute crazy. So did you escape that? big big heat is it is it just been sitting just to the north of you then yeah it it, around my area um it's been in the high 90s in fahrenheit i don't know what that is in celsius yeah no so 35 degrees celsius or something like that but that that is hot enough for us here in the uk most definitely it'd be kind of weird to talk about hot drinks now um i know you've got some water with you at the moment which is completely um smart um, but if you were um, drinking uh, some coffee or tea right now, Al, what would you usually be drinking? Uh, let's see. Well, actually, this morning I went to go get an iced coffee. Um, usually I just uh, I get I prefer cold coffee to warm coffee. And I like adding milk or creamer um, and sugar. So that's that's my type of coffee. <laughs> so where do you usually get it from? What, is there a particular kind of brand or place you like to get that from? Um, no, I'm, I'm really not picky. There's, there's quite a few coffee shops, uh, around my area and I'm trying to try all of them before I, um, leave Irvine. Awesome. So yeah, you just mentioned where you are in Irvine and for people who don't know where that is, if they, um, think of California and think of Los Angeles and you go to the Southern suburbs and I I suppose the closest place some people might've heard to Irvine might be, um, might be Anaheim. So they might have heard of that. If you're a child of the 80s and 90s like me, they would have heard of the Anaheim Mighty Ducks. <laughs> so uh, it's that part of Los Angeles, so in the southern suburbs. But of course, Los Angeles is such a huge place. We know that the suburbs really do stretch quite far out south. So yeah, tell us a little bit about what your location is like, um, Al. I mean, and how does it how does it speak to you as with your identity, as your personality? I mean, is are you kind of like 
Irvine through and through, or is there other parts of the United States or other parts of the world which which kind of formulate our, your identity? Well, let's see. That, that's a great question. Um, Irvine is uh, in Orange County, right, which is just south of LA County. So technically, like we are, you know, all part of Southern California, um, but Orange County is definitely it has its own separate personality, I guess, from LA County. Um, I'm about a 20 minute drive from Disneyland, if that's helpful for putting me on a map. Helpful for the Brits. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, but I actually, I grew up in the Bay Area, um, in the East Bay, Oakland, San Leandro area. Um, and, you know, I, I lived there for in the same house for my entire life before moving to Southern California for college. Um, so I would definitely say my heart is, the, my heart is in the bay. Mm. Yeah, I I know how that feels. I mean, a lot of people listening to this know that I spent some time in the San Francisco Bay Area, and uh, yeah, living out of an RV or in an RV in uh, Berkeley <laughs> for for a few months while working at the Exploratorium, and we'll be uh, we'll move on to talk about that actually because the Exploratorium is what we have in common. Um, mm-hmm. So for people who don't know. Of what the Exploratorium is. It's a hands-on, well, not really much for the past year, but uh, it's uh, <laughs> historically a, a hands-on um, interactive science museum um, where you go around and you, you know, you discover scientific phenomena for yourself. And, you know, as you can imagine, there's loads of events that take place there. But one of the things I loved about the Exploratorium is their, their social programs and their community-based programs. Um, and one of the lovely things that I was a part of was this, this, this resilience thing that they did where they talked to local communities and they had awareness campaigns about um, the communities in the Bay Area, you know, particularly with, say, climate change and like the the Bay, um, the King Tides flooding, like the Marion area and the areas around the Bay and how that's affecting, you know, um, poor, the poor communities around there. And one of the things that they've been doing recently, taking advantage of the pandemic situation, is something called STARS, which is you're an intern for, and you've been doing that from from Irvine. So, um, so tell us a bit about stars and how how you came about to do that because I I love it. I absolutely love it. Yeah, it, it's definitely the well, stars and stands for striving for trans inclusion and anti racism in science learning. And I came across um, information about this opportunity on Twitter actually, um, which was the first time I ever you know, been able to use social media to <laughs> network or find an opportunity like that. It, it was very cool. Um, it made me feel really modern, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was it was the first time, that was the first time I'd seen anything like that. Um, and um, it, this came about at a time when I personally was working on finishing up my applications for grad school. And uh, in all of my applications, I wrote about how passionate I was with trying to improve STEM education, um, you know, in terms of, like you mentioned, uh, equitability and accessibility. So coming across this opportunity was like perfect timing because I, I knew I could tell that I would be able to learn all these tools and hear from people about what what it actually means you know what the work that is currently being done to make stem education better you know uh, other steps that i would be able to take and just learning so much knowledge and how to apply it um was uh, really what the internship was about and getting to talk to so many people including yourself um (laughs) you know it, it was it was an amazing experience for sure. Talking to to you lot at, at Stars, you know, doing that that little thing for you um, a couple of months ago, it was one of the most joyous things that I've done in the past few months, honestly. Um, because and I, and I I think I remember you know saying this at the time, it, it brought back the nostalgia of being at the Exploratorium myself, and and you know the Exploratorium for me was one of the catalysts for me to find my own gender identity. Um, you know, I was already questioning my gender before I went to San Francisco, but it was being at the Exploratorium and hanging around such a range of diverse people there and seeing what it was doing, maybe kind of come more at peace to myself and more in tune with myself. And, and um, yeah, it's a shame that you've not set foot in the Exploratorium for this program, for the internship, because 
otherwise I'd be able to describe for you. But if you ever manage to get there, go up, upstairs into the upstairs offices, there is, uh, in the comms area, there's this desk, this table, and it's got a, a tub full of nail varnish, nail polish, different colored nail polish. And there's a sign that says um, patio plasma. I've forgotten what the actual scientist name who used to dress up in drag as patio plasma and do science stuff. All this nail varnish put out there. And I said, and I was really tempted to put it on. Like, I want to put some nail varnish in. And then somebody just said, Kit, you look at it, put, put some on. You look awesome in it. And then I did that. And then I was coming with different kinds of nail polish on every day. And then I started to change my gender expression and what I was wearing. And I was starting to go through. And like the first thing, it was like one of you, you lot, you know, it was one of the the explainers, the, the uh, field trip explainers, which is kind of an extension of STARS. It's, it's basically college and high school students who help the public to understand what was going on on the floor. Saw me walk into the exploratory when I was wearing this lace top and these kind of really kind of like leather skinny bottoms. And they said, Kit, you look awesome. I was like, oh. <laughs> so... Yeah, so when so when I talked to you in the stars, I was just like beside myself. A because of nostalgia, B because you were just amazing people to engage with and I just it just recalled like the passion and the ambition and the beauty of the diversity of people at the Exploratorium. And just the engagement that you lot had, the the joy and that well, what you were doing now. So I just want to say thank you for everything that you've been doing and also obviously shout out to Sal uh, Alpa for everything they've done. And all of your fellow stars and just say hi exploratorium stars you're all amazing we love you <laughs> we love you too you've talked a bit about how you know what it what it's done for you uh, what do you hope that stars and things like that initiatives like that will do for people looking in so i mean me and you you know we're quite visible people but what do we what do we hope what do you hope is going to do for for people in stem particularly maybe those who identify as lgbtqi i really hope that um the this you know this was the first time that there was a stars program at the exploratorium yeah. um and so i i hope that i hope that there can be another cohort like possibly next year or or maybe even 2 years from now um and i also hope that other museums or even other organizations um look at what the Exploratorium was able to do with the STARS program and realize, like, oh, we can do that too, you know, create teams um, of for transitional aged youth to come and learn and create and, you know, all, all this kind of stuff. That, that, that I think is my biggest hope for the future of STARS. And if people go about it the way that you did, it is such a joyous, fantastic way of going about it as well. And, you know, and people, everybody out there, you should definitely look up the the Exploratorium After Dark talks that, that the stars were involved with, which were really, really great. And I actually had to do the whole, you know, what was it, Vogue-in? I actually I was actually doing that. Uh, people look that up. That's amazing. Can you just explain, actually, what, because people might not know um, what transitional aged youth mean so what age group is that i mean i think i've got it in my head but just to make that clear for other people usually transitional aged youth means like ages 18 to 24 or 25 like that that period after the typical high school graduation age or like becoming legal um but before you can legal like rent a car without having to pay the young renters <laughs> fee <laughs> <laughs> yes that's a great way of putting it yeah um brilliant well we're definitely going to see if we can wrangle up some people listen everybody look it up it's an amazing thing um and i'll put the link in the description so yeah thanks for sharing us about that um it's uh, brilliant right we're going to go geeking out now yes you love to be conscious about you spatially navigate neighborhoods and the world right and you're a transportation enthusiast so you said here i find the methods of vehicular transportation fascinating from boats to trains to bicycles i like to think about the best way i can get from a to b in a way that's convenient and affordable but also respectful of your surroundings so oh where to start on that one what is i don't know if this is a weird, really weird question do you have a favorite transportation network or, or one that you would love to go and have a ride on or something? Well, let's see. I really haven't experienced as many as I, I wish I could. Um, 
Like I've, I haven't been to New York, right? Haven't experienced the New York subway system. Haven't been to London. I haven't been to plenty of places. Or if I have, it was long enough ago that I don't remember anymore. Um, but from what I have experienced, I would say I'm probably a big fan of Japan's um train system and that that covers you know a lot of things that can cover the metro the subway even their bullet trains their shinkansen mm. um but i i am a fan of japan's transportation system i would love to experience japan's yeah especially of those videos that they've been testing out that maglev train that kind of like gets up to what what was the speed they got up to oh i don't know it was probably remember. fast <laughs> <laughs> but that'd be really really cool but because of course being maglev they can't oh that's right they had to because they had to design the nose of the train a certain way because otherwise if they went through a tunnel um and the nose wasn't designed properly it would actually blow the front of the nose off because of the shock wave or some other like shock wave. yeah but it's fascinating it's, that's why it's that's why they've got really pointy noses apparently yeah make it super aerodynamic yeah okay Al, well in that case if you do ever do make it over here to the uk I'm taking you on a tour of the London Underground, right? Yay! I can't wait. Yeah, I, I took a, a class um, uh, back in January, February. Um, that was all about um, transportation and the environment. And I learned a lot about like what it takes to have a, like, a successful transportation system um, because I, I hadn't realized it before this class, but in order to have in order to have a transportation system that you know is effective and accessible requires a lot of planning on the part of the city in terms of designing a city layout um and you know making sure that things like aren't too far apart because otherwise you do need a car and making sure you know uh, there's there's enough different options like not just trains but also buses and, and if someone has a bike, making sure that they can take their bicycle on the train too. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm talking in circles now, but <laughs> there, there's a lot that goes into having like good transportation and that requires equal part from everyone involved in planning a city. So when you do move from A to B, you say that you try to be more careful to your surroundings and to your environment. So what does that what does that actually mean to you? What do, so when you're getting from A to B, what do you consider is doing it in a respectful manner to the to your surroundings? I haven't taken the bus since the pandemic, um, but prior to the pandemic, I took the bus to get around pretty much everywhere. Um, and you know, when when I would transfer between buses, or even when I was on a bus, I would. Like, keep my head up and not bury my head in a book or in my phone and just watch, you know, the people and the stores that we pass by. And there's a lot to notice. And uh, when the pandemic hit, um, I wouldn't leave very much. And when, when I did, I would ask my partner for a ride um, and she would drive me. And as we would drive to these places that I used to take the bus to, point out something and say like, oh, you know, that's where I met someone and we talked about this cool thing or, and, or like, you know, tell her little stories and tidbits of information that I gathered. And, you know, a lot of stuff that like, if you drove right by, you would never have that. Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's definitely something that um, is important to me when it comes to transportation is like acknowledging surroundings noticing things it just makes it all better i guess i really really like that al because yeah i just as you were talking i was just thinking to myself if we don't pay attention we're not able to make connections to places i mean you know this is a lot of people listen to this are geographers and i think that's going to resonate with them a lot and I think because life goes by so quickly and it literally goes by so quickly when you're in a car, you know, and things just flashing past. But if you slow down and you make a connection with a place, then you start to generate memories, you know, for better or worse. Uh, you start to generate connections and then you start to generate stories. And then, of course, stories can form 
personality, character, identity. And that's just love. I'm just picturing now you, you know, you and your partner just being in a car and rather than just like letting things flash past, you're, you're engaging with the surroundings because of your, because of having immersed yourself as you've been going past on a bus or waiting at a bus stop. Yeah. And I, I'm, you know, ex- making more personal experiences just enriches all of our lives. So it's a nice thing. Yeah. And I'm guilty of it too. We, you know, about sometimes the need to slow down, you know, I've got to do more of that. And, um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's having your head up and not burying your head in the phone is, uh, is, uh, right. I'm going to make a right out, making a public pledge to you and everybody listening, right. The next time I go out for a, for a walk or anything like that, I'm leaving my phone at home because I am guilty of one of those people who's always looking down at their litty phones. Right. So I've, I've made a promise to everybody. It's, it's now on air. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm going to segue into something else that I know that you're a big lover of because getting from A to B is great. But what about going full circle on a roller coaster and theme parks and things like that? So that's getting from A to B, but in almost a spiritual or an emotional and adrenaline filled way rather than you know, some moving in space. So yeah, I love theme parks too. Are you a th- are you a thrill seeker kind of theme park person, or are you a kind of just the general kind of atmosphere of the theme park type person? I I do appreciate a good thrill every once in a while, um, <laughs> but I I know I'm I'm still young. I'm only twenty one, but I already feel like oh my goodness. <laughs> I'm getting old, you know. I used to be a lot better about riding thrill rides, but it, it's starting to take a toll on me, um, which I know is, is silly to say since I'm so young. Um, but I, I'm definitely more of a like uh, someone who appreciates just the atmosphere and the environment and the theming and the experiences more than like roller coasters. <laughs> I totally get what you're saying now about the whole because as I've got older you get more of a sense of your vulnerability that you're not invincible anymore of course when you're young you feel a bit more you're taking risks and invincible and you want to go on everything you don't mind going on things that turn upside down or turn you inside out but as you get a bit older you're like I don't want to go yeah I have to I have to take a seat like after (laughs) after those like whoop-de-doop roller coasters I have to take a take a seat drink some water let's let's rest for a few minutes you know you could always frame it as i'm just absorbing the experience that i've just had it's all good (laughs) oh yes yes you're absolutely right i can frame that next time so what's what's your do you have a favorite theme park then is there one that you'd you've been you visited that you absolutely adore or is there one that you'd love to go to wow that's a good question um well i grew up on disney um, so Disneyland is very close to my heart and I've had an annual, since I've been living in Irvine, I've had an annual pass to Disneyland for two years before the pandemic. Um, so that, that park is close to my heart, but currently I have, uh, a season pass for, um, Knott's Berry Farm, which has been fun. Yeah. I, I went for the first time, um, just a few months ago. Uh, and loved it so much that I got a pass. <laughs> so, oh, not very far. So I went there in. Oh, now this is gonna. This no, 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 because this is like before you were born, I think. Uh, Nineteen ninety-five. <laughs> so, oh no, Al's just put their hand over their face. I was like, thanks for that, Al. That's lovely. <laughs> yeah, show my Asia. Yeah, nineteen ninety five was when I when I last went to uh, California with my family. Uh, yeah, Knott's Berry Farm. Yeah, so uh, oh, I'm just I can't remember it now. I was just I was a bratty teenager at the time, wearing a shell suit, <laughs> <laughs> bagging up memories now. So if we, I tell, look, okay, I tell you what, let's let's design. Let's design our own theme park. What would be like the most epic, best theme park in the world, do you think? Well, let's see. Most epic mm. theme park. I would I would design a theme park that's like all all of the theme parks that currently exist, all of the adventure type yeah. park parts, I would love to put all of those into one. You know, different like I don't know 
uh, underwater themed adventure area, um, old Western themed adventure, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I, I, I love adventure rides and theming and movies too. So that, that is what I would do. I agree. It's got to be like immersive. You've got, you've got to step into this theme park and you've got to, you've got to be so overwhelmed by thinking you're actually in that environment you're actually in a western movie you actually really are underwater exploring things so it can't be just like pretend you go up to a person dressed up as mickey mouse oh that's nice no it's like you start to believe hey on a minute have i really traveled to deadwood in south dakota or something you know <laughs> yeah so okay so we got western what else would we be underwater i just got to have some kind of space version that you know may, maybe not a, a plagiarism of star trek but close enough would you want something like a, a like a like a spaceship simulator, or would yeah. you want something that's like Space Mountain, where you are actually traveling in space? Space Mountain is is epically cool. It's so so cool. But at the end of the day, you know, it's it is just a roller coaster in the dark. Uh, so um, so I would want that that feeling that you've there's got to be some way of having like zero gravity, like without having to go on the vomit comet or something like that you know which is the airplane that dives down to make you feel weightless it's got to be something like that where you walk around you can float around a bit and you actually feel like you're in a space station and stuff like that oh i tell you what our theme park should do you know it's got to have hotels which are obviously themed according to their themes so you actually Absolutely. sleep in weightlessness and then stuff like that by the way we're pat we're patterning this everybody so don't steal our <laughs> ideas okay we, we'll find out we'll find out kit rackley and al snow's patterned right um yeah so i totally think that so you've got hotels right what about the food it's got to be all authentic food as well Ooh, food well whatever and this, this is just my opinion of course but whatever we decide um it's got to be themed but it also has to be uh respectful of dietary restrictions so we have to have yep. vegan options gluten-free options all of that totally and not just respectful in terms of dietary but respectful of terms of culture as well like no appropriation of i yes. i would like to kind of de-westernize decolonize the food so none of this kind of westernized version of i don't know of indian chinese i mean i'm just going all british now and i indian chinese food takeaway stuff like that it's got to be like authentic proper the trouble is what is authentic anymore when things been so globalized that's a great question yeah well i would say i i've had too many uh noodles that are made with spaghetti so if we could not do that that would be great <laughs> yeah that's just yeah <laughs> just there's noodles and there's spaghetti right i think we've got that quite down now yeah so um i think we should because what we're trying to attempt to do with theme parks i mean it is trying to it is trying to get away of a break from reality really isn't it i mean it's <laughs> That's what a theme park is to me. It's a place that you go for for a day or two and you just feel like you can just forget about the real world, the realism, and actually step into a different world completely. That makes you feel good about yourself or makes you... But I think me being an educator, and I, you probably feel the same way as well, I'm, I'm not sure, but there's got to be some kind of moral to the to the experience as well, I think. So I think yes. the final thing we should think of, Al, is what would the moral to our theme park be? What when people leave our theme park, they feel they've had an experience and they feel I never oh we're getting really deep now. I like this question. My the first place my head goes to, right, is we want we want this place to be, as you said, a, a place for people to escape from reality, escape all of their problems of the real world. But I think uh, after after they come and visit our theme park, I would love for them to feel empowered so that they feel like they can take on their problems that they were running away from. Yeah. Oh, a theme park, which is which is a genuine therapeutic experience. Fun yes. and therapeutic. In fact, we sh that's what we should call it, fun and therapy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. That sounds a bit too prosaic. I don't know. Can you have something prosaic with the word fun in it? I don't know. We'll have a think. About right. Okay, everybody. So what Al and I are going to do is uh, I'm winking at Al to say we're not, it's not a serious suggestion, but what we'll do is that we'll go away, we'll come out, and then we'll do, a, we'll do another episode, and we're going to lay out our total plans for a theme park for you all. Okay? Mm -hmm. So there. You've heard it here first, everybody. That's cool. Right. <laughs>
But I tell you what, I know what you can do for us though. You can kind of be almost like the engineer and or kind of like, because you are a person who has been studying, you're interested in studying things about condensed matter and material science, studying mater- physical materials and atomic structures. And I like what you said here. Atomic structures feel very small compared to what is basically the whole world, <laughs> which is quite profound really. But for people who are not quite, because I, I admit I'm not 100% sure myself, what, what is material science? That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely, I'm just a student, right? No expert, nothing. <laughs> um, but material science and condensed matter, which I think are very related, right? Because matter and material um, is all about studying why materials um, and elements behave the way that they do. With things like um, how they conduct heat or or electricity, um, why they are magnetized or not magnetized. And all of that, you know, boils down to um, like atoms and how atoms interact, the structure that they have with each other. And so that that's that's how I would define condensed matter slash material science. That's so cool. That actually reminds me of a book. I've still got it on my bookshelf, actually. Yeah. Um, Stuff Matters by uh, Mark Mydonik. And it does that. It talks about kind of the materialistic things in our life, but then looks at them at a, a deeper level and kind of like the story behind them. And, and you know, and not just that, but also like what humans, the meaning that humans put onto it, but also kind of like the environmental impact, all that kind of stuff. So if you've not heard of that, you should, everybody, you should definitely look that up. Stuff Matters, the, the, the strange stories of the marvellous materials that shape our man-made world. Oh, that's the full title. Winner of the two, 2014 Royal Society Winton Prize for Science Books. So, yeah, I think, uh, I think you'll like that one. How, how did you get into this kind of stuff? I mean, is, is this kind of stuff you're like, yeah, well, I'm doing it, I get it. Or, or is there some of it which just goes over your head? Uh, I would say a good chunk of it still goes over my head or it takes a bazillion <laughs> read-throughs for me to finally get it. Um, but this is, it's hard stuff, but I have realized that if you have a good instructor, if you have someone who's there to take the time to explain it to you, use the methods that work for you, it makes a lot more sense. It just, just You just have to find someone who is willing to take that time and energy to help you there's plenty of teachers listen to this and they're, they're actually, that's music to their ears that is um yeah um and it's the same with me and meteorology and atmospheric physics i i i got a i got a d in physics in my uh in my last years of high school and right in um everybody but i don't know how and I, it was probably because of the instructor the lecturer and the advice that i had but at degree level in atmospheric physics i got 100 percent in that course I have no idea how I managed that, everybody. I think that's really a testament to the fact that actually it's not necessarily about whether we understand the things, it's how we're taught them or how we are shown them is probably more important that whether we are receptible to that sort of information. And I'm a firm believer that that anyone can learn anything as long as they're given the right support. So um, are you willing to plug a name then for, for someone who's who's really, really helped you to grasp these things to give them, give them a shout out? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the professor at my university, his name is Javier Sanchez Yamagishi, and he taught my uh, intro to condensed matter class that I took just this past quarter. Um, and, you know, a, a bunch of people say, like, he's one of the best instructors here uh... for lower division physics and for upper division physics. So that is, that's who he is. He's great. There you go. Javier, you're doing an amazing job. Keep it up. Keep it up. Our, you've got our seal of approval. <laughs> no, that's really lovely to hear. And yeah, no, it's nice that when, when teachers and lecturers hear that kind of stuff, it gives them a little bit of an extra boost to go that extra mile for their, for their students. Oh, that's so lovely. That's filled my heart with warm fuzziness. <laughs> oh, right. Um, okay. We're coming to the, towards the end of our chat now. Uh, but I've had so much fun. This has been really good. And it's been nice. You're actually the first guest that I've actually, we just like kind of like riffed off each other in terms of like creative, creative something like a theme park, you know, that was just completely off the bat. We just went for it, didn't we? That was really lovely. I love that. Um, so I'd love to have done that a bit longer, but um, 
We're going to end with uh, a little thing that we do called uh, We Are All Geographers, where the uh, guest of the previous episode challenges the next guest with a word that they've got to try and link with geography and connect to the world and stuff like that. And But before we go on to give you this, well, you're probably going to find out what the word is now because of what we're going to talk about. But to lead into that We Are All Geographers segment is the one last thing I want us to talk about is that you uh, say that you're an amateur because you put it in brackets so everybody i'm doing that quote thing in the in the camera right that you can't see <laughs> so al is an amateur musician and they really love to perform so musician right so i'm giving you a hint already um so right musician is that vocal instrumental djing how well, how do you classify yourself as an amateur musician mostly vocal um I, you know, I did a bunch of theater stuff in high school. Um, as I've discovered, <laughs> most LGBTQ kids seem to do. <laughs> but yeah, uh, in, <laughs> um, in college, uh, for my first two years, I was part of uh, an all women's choir um, before I realized that I'm not a woman. So I took a step <laughs> back with that. Um, and I, I miss it very much. Um, that, that that's I, I very I like to perform and although I haven't done it in quite a while I, I miss it a lot and so that's why I call myself an amateur because I'm not really like <laughs> a, a practicing performer sure. um, but hopefully someday I can do that again yeah so uh, it's there's there's got a bit I, I'm totally totally with you um the, the same with me I, I'd never really fit I'd sang a lot I was in theater a lot and I found much more joy through theater and and drama and acting and I actually tossed a coin because in the UK you've got to choose options to what you're going to focus on at high school and geography and drama for me were in what we call the same options block so they were on at the same time in the timetable so I literally tossed I oh know I was doing that sad thing and I totally I tossed a coin and it was I, I can't remember if it was heads which was heads and which was tails but it was like heads drama tails geography and obviously it landed on geography but i tried to do drama as an extracurricular thing um but yeah i loved it i loved it but i don't know i felt out of place with the whole singing kind of thing because the singing almost seemed to be quite gendered in a sense at least in the circles that i was doing it in um and i don't know i i sometimes get dysphoric about my voice and and i don't really like being a a tenor for example but even though that's what my voice fits best so yeah it's I feel the same way that I will find my place again some way but um is there a kind of so for me I I, I like singing anything like um what was it from Rent um 500 minutes seasons of love yeah I'm just so random I'm so sorry Al um no but I love it so yeah, and I just I do I did that, and I've done some choir music stuff like that. But yeah, it's is um what what was your kind of thing that that you used to sing, or or if you could go back into singing, what would you what would be the kind of genre or the or the uh, or the one that you'd like to go into, if any? Oh, I've done so I've done choir for a few years, and I did musical theater singing both um, in ensemble and solo parts um but i've never done I, i'd love to i'd love to perform in a band like i don't know how i would ever do that but it is something that i would love to be a part of at some point someday maybe wow it might happen when you go up to washington who knows who knows i'm kind of hoping for that we'll see yeah yeah anybody up there in in washington al's coming for you right <laughs> So, I don't know if you can guess it now, but the word, so Jess, Dr. Jess Tipton, who I had on last time, she is someone who dabbled in a bit of music herself. She was actually in a uh, a clarinet a trio called the Marylebone Trio. Um, she's no longer in that now, but uh, she loves music. And so the word she came up with was, was music. So, uh, yeah. So um, what we do in this respect then now, so... All our guests have 30 seconds to just say what they can about how music links into geography. So place, environment, whatever it is. All right. I'll, I'll give it I'll give it my best shot. Right. OK, so Al, you are to link music and geography in 30 seconds. Off you go. Well, I would say music is uh, music is what's it called? 
personal to every part of the world. Like every part of the world has a different type of music they create, different instruments they use, different vocal techniques. And so geography and music, I think we're very closely tied because, you know, going, you can travel to all these different places and every place will have a different sound, a different piece of art. The end. Yay. Perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, music, music is is such a great tool for teaching geography as well. I used to, every time I used to teach place and cultures and things like that, always, always started the lesson with a song or a music. So I had, I had a Spotify playlist, playlists for everything I used to teach. So it would be, even when we were take, teaching, um, you know, tectonics, plate tectonics, I had like Jimmy Buffett's volcano in there, you know, I don't know, I don't know when I'm going to go when the volcano blows. Mr. Up there, you know, so I had that and then I had... Um, and then, you know, I'd you know, traditional Chinese music, but also Chinese pop music when we used to do about China and Chinese culture. So, yeah, I mean, there's so much you can do. And of course, so things can be communicated through music as well. So, yeah, you you nailed it there. Al. Well done. Good stuff. So because um, as, as you've written here, as you said here, music and art transcends physical boundaries and can be deeply rooted in culture, which is a perfect line. You said that. And uh, yeah. And you say the same goes for education. So. For the next guest, Al, what are you going to come up? What word would you like to challenge them to geography? Plants. Plants. Yep. That's going to be a nice group. That's going to be one of those ones where they're going to be stuck about how to approach that one because they're like, where do I start? (laughs) (laughs) Perfect. But good because they might come up with something that someone didn't think about. Mm -hmm. Right. Plants it is. I just want to say, um, Al, that it's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure talking to you. And it warms my heart to know that people like yourself and and your stars colleagues are out there and it's absolutely fabulous. So um, moving on now to finish off with the shout outs, we've we've given the stars a shout out. We've given Javier a shout out, your wonderful professor. Is there anyone else you'd like to say hi to? Um, I don't know if my parents will listen to this, but if they do, hello, parents. I love you. Um, Hi, I was parents. Yeah, uh, you're awesome too. And uh, all any of my friends who listen to me talk about the things that I love, <laughs> thanks for listening. Um, oh. Thank you to Kit for having me. This has been a wonderful oh. experience. Uh, I'm blinking. It's been, <laughs> it's been totally my <laughs> pleasure, honestly. Oh, lovely. And um, if if people want to um, connect with you, because you have a you have a Twitter account, so uh, your Twitter hand your tw- Twitter Twitter your Twitter handle. <laughs> what's, what's your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is Snowbuffet, like Boba Fett, except the B O you replace with snow. How did I not notice that? How did I not notice that? <laughs> <laughs> I've really just noticed it. <laughs> oh, that is so cool! Right? Okay, I'm such a muppet for not spotting that. <laughs> I'm up it. I don't know. Right, Al. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, we, we're going to have to end. We, we're going to end on that now. Kit making an absolute muppet of themselves. <laughs> right, Al. Thank you so much. I really, really had so much fun. And yeah, and good luck with your graduate studies uh, when you move up there to Washington. And uh, I will, we'll keep in touch. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you had fun. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe so more stories and experiences can drop into your favorite podcast app. If you fancy being a guest or have any feedback, follow us on Twitter at CoffeeJogPod and send us a DM. Or you could email coffeeandjog at geogramblings.com. Until next time, keep jogging.